morning, Austin Ridge. It's great to be in Building D today. I want to say thank you. I want to say good morning to Building A and also Southwest and Dripping campuses. It, it's so funny. Uh, there is no one on the front row, and people in the corners are sitting on each other's laps. Like, I don't know. Doesn't connect to my message. I just thought I'd make that point. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. Just so you guys know, in all of our venues, every once in a while, we take cash to the bottom of the seats on the first row. Just throwing that out there. (laughs) John 16. Start with a little story I heard. uh, A guy named Jorge Rodriguez. He was a Mexican bank robber. And he used to rob banks down on the Texas border, the Mexico border, uh, near the Rio Grande, and, and it was really at the turn of the 1800s and the 1900s. He, he stole a lot of money from a lot of banks. And Texas got so concerned about this because he would rob a bank on the Texas side and then run back to the other side. They sent Texas Rangers into Mexico. It's one of the few times that's actually happened in history. And there was a certain ranger that actually called up with Jorge. He was in this town. He saw him. He heard him. He heard other people talk to him. He heard his name over and over. And he came right up behind him outside on the street and had his pistol in his back. And he says, I know who you are, and I'm here to get all the money, and if you don't turn it over to me, you're a dead man. Well, what he didn't realize is Jorge did not understand English whatsoever. (laughs) And this Texas Ranger didn't speak Spanish. And so they had this this, uh, verbal impasse, if you will. And so there was a young guy in the street watching all this happen, and kind of came up and says, hey, I speak English and Spanish. Can I translate? So the ranger thought that would be a great idea. So he said it to him again. I want all the money or you're going to be a dead man. And it was interesting how this man answered the ranger. He said, I've got every penny of it. Tell him, tell him. And if you'll go to the town well, if you'll face north, I don't know if that's north or not. I just turn that way. If you'll face north. Go down five stones in the well, and you'll notice the fifth stone is loose. If you pull that stone out, all the money is right there. And and the Texas Ranger is a little anxious, and he's waiting for the guy to translate. And the guy looks at him and says, Jorge Rodriguez is a brave man. He's ready to die. (laughs) I thought of that story this week, and it reminded me, that what we don't know or what we don't understand can really hurt us. And that's kind of what I want to talk about today. There's some things that Jesus is going to tell his disciples as he continues the upper room discourse. We're getting toward the end of this discourse, if you will. He's telling them information that if you don't understand these things and you don't know these things, things are not going to go well for you. So he tells them at the beginning of chapter 15, you need to stay close to me, abide in me, and I'll abide in you. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But in me and through me, I can do all things. And then he talks about persecution is going to come because once you abide in me, I'm going to to have you love people. And some people aren't going to like the way you love them. Some people aren't going to want to hear the gospel. And you're going to be persecuted because you're walking close to me. And when that persecution comes, I want you to know that this should not be surprising. It's going to happen. He promised it's going to happen. The world's not getting better and better. It's kind of spiraling downward. As we talked about last week, more Christians martyred in the last century than all the centuries prior combined. And then he gets past that and he starts talking about some things that hopefully would turn their sadness into joy. Because he's about to leave and they're kind of feeling like what I would call spiritual orphans. And our leader's about to go and they're down. Look with me at verse 4. We'll pick up where we left off last week. Verse 4 in chapter 16. But I've said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. You see, when Jesus was in the flesh, he was not omnipresent, meaning he could not be everywhere all at the same time. He could be at one location, one locale. And so these men are about to experience the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit, and the singular presence of God in the flesh is about to change into the omnipresent presence of the Spirit of God in every believer's life. And they're down because he's leaving, but if they really understood what he's saying, 
they would be blown away and in awe and rejoicing because they're about to experience the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which up to this point in your Bible only happened in the Old Testament in spurts and circumstances for certain people. But now every believer who trusts in Christ will have the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit living inside. Here at the Ridge, we believe what the Bible teaches. You can't lose your salvation. You didn't do anything to get it. You can't do anything to lose it. If you could earn it, I promise you, you have lost it. So your salvation is not based on your good works. Your salvation is based on the good work of Jesus by grace through faith. That is the gospel. And so he's telling them, I'm about to leave. The Holy Spirit's going to come and reside with you. And he's going to allow you to share the gospel, to share my message with other people. Some people are going to like it. Some people aren't going to like it. But you can't save anyone. You can't convert anyone. You can't argue someone in the kingdom. But you just be faithful and tell the message and the Spirit will do his work. Look with me down at verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, capitalized, Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. He will convict the world. He will convict the world concerning three things. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. Sin is our guilt. For someone to understand and believe that they are a sinner and they are guilty and apart from Christ and his grace, I'll never be good enough to go to heaven, is a gift from the Holy Spirit to our hearts. That is not something that natural men, natural women are ever going to come to that resolution. They'll write psychology books. They'll write sociology books. They'll do podcasts on how to make this place a better place. They'll talk about finding the inner you. They'll talk about finding through meditation how great you are as a person. But they'll never come to the conclusion that man left to themselves is done under his own condemnation. And there's nothing that person can do to come to Christ unless the Holy Spirit convicts and converts and changes that person. Now, I just dumped a lot of theology on you guys. That is what we call the doctrine of total depravity. That is also the doctrine of soteriology, the doctrine of sin. That is also the doctrine of salvation. That is also the doctrine of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ and his atonement on the cross. Now, those are a lot of churchy words. What I'm saying is this, without Jesus, there's no hope. It doesn't matter how good you are. Without Jesus, there's no hope. The Bible says that Jesus is the only way of the Father. So sin, he'll convict towards sin, which is our guilt. Righteousness, which is an understanding under our guilt of our helplessness. He'll also convict us of judgment, which he'll convict that is our destiny, apart from putting our faith and trust in Christ. He uses the word there, convict. It's actually a legal term in the Greek. In the Greek, it literally means to expose or to bring to light. Another way of translating that would be to pronounce a verdict. And so again, look with me at those two verses again, back to verse 7. Nevertheless, I'll tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. If I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict, he will expose, he will bring an indictment to the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. It's interesting because believers, technically speaking, are not here to judge the world. Believers, technically speaking, are here to condemn the world through our righteous behavior and through our understanding of who Jesus is. We don't say we condemn them, but our lives, like I said last week, our lives should be a fork in the road that people hit up against people all day, all week, all month, all year, and then they hit a Christian and go, whoa, that was different. That our lives should be a difference in a world that creates a conviction that the Holy Spirit fosters in their heart and only the Holy Spirit can convince them that I'm helpless in my own self-righteousness and judgment is my destiny and apart from Jesus, I have no hope. It is our job to witness. It is the Spirit's job to convert and to convict. But what Christians tend to do is we tend to judge And we tend to decide in our own minds, they'll never come to Christ. My father will never come to Christ. If you knew my mom, you wouldn't waste your prayers. She'll never come to Christ. The fact that you came to Christ should blow that away in your life. The fact that I came to Christ or anyone in this room, there's not degrees of lostness in the Bible. You're either a child of God or you're not. 
See, we categorize people of, he's not a believer, but they're really good people. People ask me sometimes, why do bad things happen to good people? Biblical answer, there's no good people. Now, there are people that can be kind. There are people that can be just. There are people that can love other people and serve other people. But merely at that point, they're only living above their own philosophical view of life because ultimately, apart from having God in your life, why serve anyone? Why be kind? Because you are your own natural law, and what you do should be your agenda, and you really don't care how that affects anyone else. The fact that anyone lives above that as a non-Jesus following person, is merely they're living above their own life understanding, their own philosophy of living. And as Jesus is saying these things, he's saying, I'm about to leave, and they should have been rejoicing. Let me tell you why. If Jesus leaves to the Father, the Father is either going to receive him or not. If he doesn't receive Jesus, Jesus comes back. We have no hope. But the fact that Jesus was without sin rose from the dead, conquered death, ascended from the dead, and ascended to the Father, and he did not come back after that first ascension, tells us that he was accepted by the Father. The only person that's holy enough to be acceptable before the Father in heaven is Jesus and those who place their faith and trust in Jesus. This text gets interesting because now he's going to go through sin, righteousness, and judgment. Look with me at verse 9 as we look at sin. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. It's interesting. Jesus says the sole thing that the Holy Spirit convicts about, one singular thing, is the lack of faith in Jesus. That your individual sins, plural, do not condemn you. What condemns a person is their self-righteousness being a place above the righteousness of Christ. What condemns people biblically is not that they do bad things, think bad things, or go bad places. What condemns human people biblically is they haven't placed their faith and trust in Christ. They don't believe he is who he said he was. And so what the Bible is also saying is your sin has already sealed your destination regardless of how you behave. Now, guys, this is so contrary to what a lot of us heard growing up in church. Be good little boys and girls. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't cuss, don't hang out with people who do. If you grew up in that kind of church environment, this is hard for you because we will look at a story in the Bible like the prodigal son and we'll go, okay, there was a wayward son and there was a good son. The, the failure in that story is the good son. <laughs> the failure in that story is the one who sits back and thinks, I'm the good guy. And so I think the hardest thing for us, people come to me and say, I haven't ever been to church. I'm like, awesome, we have a, a clean slate with you. But when people come and say, I've been in church my whole life, my first thought is, I wonder if they understand grace. Because if we've been in church our whole life, and I grew up in church, the thought is, be good, and God will do good things for you. If you're bad, he'll do some bad things for you, and then you'll have to get good again. That's a horrible way to go through life. Because sometimes you're going to be faithful and obedient and bad things are going to happen. Sometimes you're going to be unfaithful and obedient and good things are going to happen. And then all of a sudden you're going to get disillusioned with God because you're going to think he's not being fair. And here's the truth, guys. We don't want God to be fair. We want God to be just. If God is fair, we're all condemned. Because a mom's a sinner, a dad's a sinner, they had us, guess what we are? What? Sinner. We don't want God to be fair. We want mercy. But we don't want to treat other people that way. I go down BK Road, people drive slow in the passing lane. I want fire to come down from heaven at that moment. Like, bam, <laughs> right? I want judgment. Isn't it funny how we want judgment on everybody else but us? Isn't it funny that man can be hurt by other people and it really, they take it hard, but it doesn't bother them as much when they hurt other people? That we are all hypocritical in a lot of ways in our behavior and our love or lack of love, I should say, toward other people. That we judge other people harsher than we judge ourselves. We categorize other people. I've said this before. People come to me and say, hey, I ask them, you got any church around here? Well, I quit going to church a while back. Why? Because there are a bunch of hypocrites. I completely agree. And so are you. Come be a hypocrite with us, right? That's why we always say, if you find a perfect church, don't go. You'll mess it up. We all have sin in our life. We all have things that are embarrassing to us. 
And if you don't think that's true, what if I say, we got your whole life on camera, we're going to watch the last week, and we're even going to hear your thoughts? Ouch. I bet we would be lowly attended the next hour. You'd be texting your friends, don't go to church today. <laughs> so the Holy Spirit will take the knowledge of Jesus and the preaching of the gospel and convince and convict people that they are sinners, that lack true righteousness, that their self-righteousness isn't good enough, and that judgment is pending, and that they would place their faith and trust in Christ. Through the preaching of the gospel and through the conviction of the Spirit, God can do a miracle in someone's life. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. That God had to not just change me, he had to change me. It wasn't just cleaning up my mouth and my language. It was cleaning out everything inside of me. The way I view relationships, the way I treat people, the way I don't treat people, that God had to do a new work. And there's only two options biblically. Either you're trusting that you're gonna be good enough to go to heaven or that you're trusting that Jesus was accepted by the Father. If Jesus had come back, we have no hope. He stayed. He hasn't come back yet. He hasn't come the second coming yet. That proves he was accepted. Look at verse 10. He talks about righteousness. Concerning righteousness, the Holy Spirit convicts, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Jesus alone is the only satisfactory, self-righteous person. How good do you have to be go to heaven? Well, let's just start with, when I think of a human being that people think is good, who comes to mind? Billy Graham. Saw some of you mouthing it. Billy Graham. Billy Graham's not good enough to make it in heaven apart from the perfection of Jesus. Billy Graham could lead millions to Christ, but if he's never placed his personal faith and trust in Christ, Billy Graham's not going to heaven. Mother Teresa, not good enough. She will die a great humanitarian. She will, they will have plaques about her. They will name a building after her. But unless she has placed her personal faith in Christ. My wife came to Christ in her 20s, even though she grew up in church, and she went to an organization called BSF in Dallas. And she heard the gospel for the first time, and it clicked. And we've talked about this before. How sad is it you can grow up in church your whole life and still think that it's just about being a good little boy or a good little girl? And they never hear that it takes a personal, daily relationship in Christ. Now, some of you may be sitting there thinking, I get it. He's talking about the gospel again. I hope someone here needs this. I'm good. We've got a problem. Because even now, if you've been a Christian 30, 40, 50, 60 years, this should blow you away. You have to be as good as Jesus to get in. The only way you're going to get on your own merit is you die and you resurrect from the dead on your own power. I've done a lot of funerals. I've never seen a resurrection yet. One day we're going to see a resurrection. I haven't seen one yet. Because that person laying there is a sinner. And sin has a hold on them. He has a claim on them. Jesus is the only one who died and the grave is empty. Satan had no hold. At that moment when Jesus rose from the dead, Satan was a defeated foe. But put yourself in the place of the disciples there. He's saying, I'm going to go away and you won't see me again. And they're sad, which we can totally understand. And then look down with me at verse 11, concerning judgment. Because the ruler of this world is judged. To defeat Satan, Jesus died on a cross, rose from the dead, and to confirm that he actually rose on his own power, he was accepted by the Father. If he had come back, guess who's running this place? Not God. But because he came back, we now have a defeated foe who runs this world. He doesn't have power over us. People ask me all the time about, do you think Satan can make believers do things or not do things? Or, First of all, Satan's not omnipresent, so I doubt you've ever been in the presence of Satan yourself in your lifetime, just to be honest. He can be one place at one time. Second of all, he runs reruns constantly. He doesn't come up with any new sins historically. The seven deadly sins historically are still the seven sins that we all struggle with. Lust, pride, slothfulness, gluttony, on and on and on. He doesn't come up with new stuff. But what he's done is, and it's brilliant, he set this entire culture, this entire world system up, and he'll even cause people to be very religious, even spiritual. Satan loves spirituality. He loves religion. He just doesn't want the object of the spirituality to be clear. He can create whole false languages that will take whole generations and whole continents 
under his bondage. Now, what that doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that Jesus can't still do work in those places. Right now, there's a revival going on in Iran. It's unbelievable. People are turning from Islam to Christianity because they realize there's no hope in it. Because whether it's, it's, it's being a Muslim or being a Hindu or being a Buddhist, it still comes down to you being good enough that when you die, you pass on to the, to the reward. Christianity already tells you on the front end, you're not going to pass on. You're not good enough. But there is one who is, and when you trust in him, what's true of him now becomes true of you. You cannot have an infinite, absolute God unless he reveals himself. So the question I ask now is, has God revealed himself? And if so, how has God revealed himself? We'll spend the rest of our time talking about that, verses 12 through 15. Verse 12. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. That's a very interesting verse. We're going to see that Jesus is saying some things that they don't like. I'm going to die. I'm going to leave. You won't see me for a while. And they are heartbroken. We also see through the rest of the gospel, they didn't understand what he was saying. Peter pulls a sword out when they come to take him away instead of Peter going, you know what? This is what Jesus told us he was going to do. This is the Father's will. I'm going to submit to that because I trust the Father. No, he did not understand. They don't even understand after he dies on the cross because they go into the upper room and they're scared to death. And they literally are not going to leave these four walls until Jesus walks through one of the walls. And then all of a sudden they get this courage and this this uh, faith, if you will, how do they get that courage? Thomas says, I won't believe unless I can touch the wound on his side. There you go. Go ahead and check it out. Yep, there's a hole there. That's him. They saw the resurrected Jesus. It took a resurrection for people to have faith. And these are people that spent three years with Christ every day. But what's now, what's amazing is, he says, there are so many things I'd love to tell you I can't tell you yet. Because Peter's over there going, Lord, not on my watch, you're not going to die. He says, look what he says, you can't bear them now. These guys were struggling with the thought that Jesus had to die and go to heaven. There's no way they could bear the things he's about to teach them. Like Gentiles being grafted in. Not long after this, Cornelius is going to have a dream, a Gentile man, sin for Peter. Peter's not going to want to go to his house because Jewish people didn't go to houses of Gentiles. They didn't understand the gospel yet. And then all of a sudden, he gets a dream from God. He says, go, it's okay. So he shows up, Cornelius and all his family come to Christ. The grafting in of the Gentiles, there's no way these guys can handle that yet. The indwelling daily uh, ministry of the Holy Spirit, they couldn't handle that yet. How scripture was going to be written, the New Testament, they didn't have a New Testament. They couldn't handle that yet. The rapture, the second coming of Christ, the church age, that people have a complete canon and they understand the gospel fully from the beginning of the Old Testament to the end of the New Testament. They had no concept of any of those things. That's what he's talking about. He says, you can't bear them now. Think of the whole Tom Cruise movie. You can't handle the truth. That's exactly what Jesus is saying. Look at verse 13. When the spirit of truth comes, who's that? Holy Spirit. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. All truth. He'll guide you into how much truth? All truth. Meaning this, the canon, the scriptures, 66 books, it's finished. No need for a 67th book. I say this all the time. Someone knocks on the door and says, do you believe in God can still reveal new revelation to prophets? Well, I guess he can. No, he can't. Not biblical truth. He can give opinions to people. People can meditate. People can do yoga. People can drink certain kinds of teas and just hum. They can get an illumination. It could just be the bad burrito the night before, but it's not holy scripture. Do you understand what I'm saying? So this is really important because I want to really apply this because I think we struggle with this. He says, I will guide you into all truth. He is the spirit of truth. The source of all truth is not man. The source of all truth is God through his son, by the work of the Holy Spirit, through the witnesses to that understanding. Christians. Revelation comes, not new, but confirming and explaining and clarifying the revelation you already have. 
So I know that for Christians, we love to get this deeper spirituality, this, if I read this book, or if I do this Bible study, or if I can, you know, go to this place, and then I'll really be spiritual, really be holy. It is so comforting to me to know that I don't have to go all over the world and read every book to try to figure out how to get deep with Jesus. If you've got the Holy Spirit of God, the, the Spirit of truth living inside of you, you are as deep as it gets. Doesn't mean you're perfect, doesn't mean you don't struggle, but there is no new revelation that you need. Someone knocks on the door, I'm good. But let me tell you about real truth. Come on in. I love when people come over to pull out my Greek New Testament. They just freak them out. Well, right, let's look at the Greek on that. And people, here's what I've learned. They don't want to know the truth because they got their system set. Do you know what I'm talking about? So I've got my thing where if I do this, 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 and this, and this, then God will do this, this, and this, and this, and now God's indebted to me, and then I'll get this when I die. That's what every religion promises. Christianity does not promise that. Christianity says there's no this, this, and this, and this. There's just Jesus. Jesus plus nothing. You place your faith and trust in Christ, what's true of him, and that becomes true of you. Look with me at verse 14. He will glorify me. The Holy Spirit will glorify Jesus. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. How will the scriptures come to these men to write? Jesus says the Holy Spirit will declare this truth to you. I can't tell you the truth yet. You can't bear it. But there's going to come a time where you're actually going to write more Bible. They didn't understand that at this point. We know that looking back. They had no clue what he was talking about. There's things I want to tell you. I can't tell you right now. You can't handle the truth. But the Holy Spirit's going to come. The Holy Spirit's going to remind you of all the things I've said and done. And is going to continue to reveal all the truth that comes from the Father and a few things I want you to understand. The New Testament writers are not going to some kind of trance and their hand just started moving magically. They use their own personalities. They use their own writing gifts. Luke writes totally different than John, writes totally different than Mark. But what God did was he superintended over them. He overshadowed them, empowered them to write things they would never would have written. If man would have written a Bible, it wouldn't show all the faults of man. It would show all the great successes of man. The Bible shows all the faults of man. If man had created this Bible, we would just say, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and be a good Texan. And that would just be it. And everybody has to move to Texas, which everybody seems to be doing anyway. That's not what the Bible says because it's not written by men. It was the natural writing by human authors empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now the question is, how can a divine book be written by sinful people? The answer is it can't. Unless God the Holy Spirit overshadows them to write exactly what the Father wants written. Meaning this, there's nothing in this Bible he did not want in here, and there's nothing not in this Bible that he wanted in here. It's kind of like, and I heard a pastor use this illustration one time, it's kind of like, can an 18-month-old ride a bike? No, it's impossible. Never seen an 18-month-old ride a bike. My son, Luke, who was two, rode a skateboard. That's as close as I've seen. Unless... You put that 18-month-old on a bike, and there's a higher power, a bigger strength, overseeing, guiding, steering that bike. You see that dad's hand on the back seat, and he's kind of steering that bike, and that kid's looking back going, Daddy, I'm doing it, I'm doing it, I'm doing it. Yes, you are, son. No, he's not. Yes, you are, son. You're amazing. And then he's going to try to ride the bike when his dad's not around one day, and what's he going to do? Boom. That's what religion does, by the way. Christianity says, my dad is holding the bike. This is amazing. I never would have been able to ride a bike without him. He is unbelievable. But what man does is says, look at me. I'm an 18-month-old riding the bike. I am unbelievably awesome. And that's what man continues to think. Have you ever heard someone say this? I like Jesus. I don't like what Paul says. What Jesus is saying is this. Please get this. All truth is going to come. And what Jesus said, and what Paul is going to write through the spirit of truth, and what Peter is going to write through the spirit of truth, and John and James, is just as much from the Father as Jesus saying it. I'm going to bring you to all truth. What that means is Leviticus is just as holy of a book as the Gospel of John. So when people say to me, why do you ever teach the Old Testament? I just like the New Testament. It makes me feel better. Same God, Old and New Testament. First of all, it's not even the correct words. We should call it First Testament, Second Testament, right? Because nobody likes anything old, right? Old Testament, New Testament. 
same inspired work. So in verse 14, look at it again. He will glorify me for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Who's the you there? Who's he talking to? The apostles, the disciples. You are going to write the Bible. The Holy Spirit of truth is going to empower you to do so. It's going to be from the Father, through the Spirit, overshadowing you to write something divine. What that means again is, our Mormon friends, and I don't care what some guy in his kitchen thought he saw or heard hundreds of years ago. We have a complete canon now. I don't need extra revelation. Watchtower Magazine. I don't care what somebody thinks that writes in Watchtower Magazine. I don't need added revelation. I have a, unless you are part of you, in verse 14, the Bible does not validate it as being scripture. Let me go a step further. When the Pope says things, does it automatically become scripture or not? No. Because no man was an eyewitness to the life of Jesus the way the yous we're right here. The only promise the Bible makes is to the yous in that verse. That's the apostles. That's the eyewitnesses of Christ. Mark wasn't an apostle, but he was commissioned by Peter. Luke wasn't an apostle, but he was commissioned by Paul. We don't have any more apostles. Sometimes you go to churches, people call each other Apostle Brad, Apostle Peter. I would never let you call me that because I'm not an apostle. What about bishop? Don't like that either. Not a bishop. <laughs> People come in and say, what should we call you? Brad. Call me Brad because I'm just like you. <laughs> I have a revelation. I did nothing to get it. I can't keep it unless God empowers me. And when I ride my bike every day, I just point to him because I know I can't ride the bike. Does that make sense? Is this making sense? So the spirit of God will never tell you something that the word of God doesn't confirm. I've said that so many times, but let me apply it because I don't think we really believe it. Because when we get emotional in a relationship or we get hurt, we start to think that God tells us things that can't be validated in the scriptures, but we think that God has given us a special revelation for our particular situation. Let me give some examples. If the spirit of God is the spirit of truth, and only the eyewitnesses of Jesus could write through the power of the Spirit the words that we have, and these words are divine. They're not just inspired, they are inerrant in its original languages. If that's true, I don't have to read a book called The Shack to know about the Trinity. Does that make sense? I learned about the Trinity through my Bible. I read about the Trinity in Genesis 1 and how they all act. I read about the Trinity right here, from the Father, the Son, through the Holy Spirit. I don't need someone to go into a meditative state to give me a new revelation of the Trinity. Now, as we talk about things like this, I may ruffle your feathers. That's not my intent. I want to educate you on what the Bible teaches on this. Some of us love Bible studies that put Jesus talking to us in the first person. I think we have to be real careful with that. Because then we start to collide what some author wrote Jesus is saying to you without maybe validating the scriptures over it. You know what I'm saying? So sometimes we think when something's in the first person to us, we think that author must have as much insight as Paul did. That author was not an eyewitness of Jesus like Paul was. So I think we have to be real careful sometimes. I think a lot of people read devotionals more than the scriptures. There's a problem with that. Because that's an author that's not inspired. These authors are inspired. I agree with Mark Twain. I agree with what he said about the Bible. It's not the things which I do not understand the Bible which told me. It's the things I do understand. I don't really need more revelation, to be honest with you. I can't keep up with all the revelation I have. I can't keep up with love others the way you want to be loved. That's varsity Christianity right there. I can't keep up with just that. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. Ugh, that's hard. <laughs> right? <laughs> Love your husbands, respect your husbands, be tender with them. Hard. Because we're married to big fat sinners just like us. I believe that my hands are full with these 66 books, theologically, doctrinally, philosophically, historically, prophetically. These 66 books 
or the inerrant, infallible word of God. You may have a book, maybe you grew up Catholic or another tradition where they have something called the Apocrypha, which is some books in between the Old and New Testament. I believe those books are entertaining. I don't think they're divinely inspired or they would be in the original canon. They were added later. That's why I don't preach out of 1 Maccabees. Does that make sense? Because it's not inspired. It didn't hit the criteria that the early church fathers were told through the wisdom of God of what went in the canon and what did not go into the canon. And I'm so thrilled that I don't have to be on this lifelong pursuit of truth. I have truth. The spirit of truth lives inside of me. Pascal said this, I think he was right. He said, a man is great insofar as he realizes that he is wretched. I've had people tell me before, Brad, you talk too much about sin. I just feel horrible. I've had people tell me, you talk so much about sin, and I know I'm a sinner. You don't have to convince me anymore. Well, if you know you're a sinner, you're the minority. So I'm still preaching to the majority that we really don't think we're that sinful. And the Bible says that you and I were not just lost. We were, Romans 5, 8, at enmity with God, and you're born that way. It's not environmental factors that make you an enemy of God. It's DNA sin that is transferred from your parents into your life that makes you an enmity with God. But praise and glory be to Jesus Christ who has died on the cross for our sins, something we could never be good enough, and his blood, through our faith in his grace, we now are seen as perfect as Jesus is before the Father. So when we go to the Father, we'll be accepted, and we won't return back just like Jesus did. That's the glory of the gospel. Some years ago, a certain young woman sat in a church service, and she heard the preacher talking about sin and salvation, and maybe like some of you who come to Ridge sometimes, she sat there just feeling totally unworthy. Like, I need to clean myself up before I can even come back to this place. I've had people tell me, I can't go to church until I just clean up my life. No, you come to church because your life's not cleaned up, <laughs> right? Let Jesus clean your life up. And this woman was sitting in the church, this pastor was preaching about sin, probably some of the same things I've said today. And she just started feeling this overwhelming sense of hopelessness, if you can imagine. Maybe you felt that at times. And the story goes that this pastor, and I may try this one Sunday, stops in the middle of the sermon and points his finger right at her. I'm trying not to point at one person. <laughs> points his finger right at her. She's sitting on the back row. And he said to her, and I quote, you sitting back at the back, you can be saved now and you don't need to do anything. Now that's not an amazing discourse on the gospel, is it? Hey, you back there, you can come to Christ today and it's not about how good you are. She literally said at that moment, I believe those words that, pre that preacher said to me. And in that moment, I felt a peace and a joy that I've been longing for my entire life. She said, the, she said that she went home that night. Her name was Charlotte Elliott. She went home that night and wrote a well-known hymn, Just As I Am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou biddest me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. You may have grown up in a church like I did that was sung every Sunday morning. That's because if Charlotte Elliott was sitting in a church one day and some pastor had the gall to love her courageously enough to point a bony finger at her and say, you don't have to do anything, just come. There are only two possible responses to the convicting work of the Holy Spirit it's either repentance or rejection. If you don't repent and follow Christ, you're rejecting Christ again. And what's true, and I would be amiss not to tell you this, I don't know how many offers someone gets necessarily to trust in Christ, but I'm laying out as clear as I know how this morning an offer to you. Offer, that doesn't sound right. That's not the right word. The understanding to you that today you can trust in Christ and you don't have to do anything but you're convinced that I know I'm a sinner. <laughs> I know. And I, I believe that Jesus is who he said he was. And I believe he died. I believe he rose from the dead. And I believe judgment's coming. And I don't want that judgment to be toward me without Jesus being in front of me. And so today I place my faith and trust in Christ. Maybe you've never done that before. 
But I'm telling you, I don't know how many offers a person may get. Maybe someone gets one offer a lifetime. Maybe someone gets 150 offers. I don't know. This could be 148 of 150. You're running out of time. We do funerals almost every week here at the Riz now. We're not guaranteed next Sunday. So I bid you come. And if you're convinced of sin and convinced of your lack of righteousness and you're convinced that Jesus is who he said he is, that is the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That is a gift from him that he may never offer again. So I lay it before you today. Come to Christ. I beg you, trust in Christ. It is such a more joyful, peaceful way to live. I watch Christians get bad phone calls from the doctors and go to the hospitals, and I watch their joy just mount. They don't like it, but there's a rock inside of them that does not budge in those moments. I watch people without Christ get the same calls, and everybody in that family becomes bitter and angry and there's turmoil, and there becomes greed if someone may possibly die. There's nothing worse than watching families argue over an inheritance. Let me tell you, if you're a child of God, you're gonna get an inheritance that won't make you worry about whether you have one or two zeros on your inheritance here. It will not matter. Because one day, one day very soon, we're gonna be with our Father in heaven and everything that's his is gonna be ours in Christ Jesus. And that allows you to take shots in this planet. That allows you to let rocks be thrown. That allows you to let people vent on you. That allows you to let you get bad emails or bad social media things. That allows you to say, you know what? <laughs> All I know is I love Jesus and I'm gonna be with him soon. I'm good. It is an amazing peace to be with Jesus. So I beg you this morning to place your faith and trust in him. You can do that by praying with me right now. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this amazing truth of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth. I love, Father, that you put in the scripture and you called the third person of the Trinity the spirit of truth, that it is impossible for anything to come from the Holy Spirit of God that's not of you, that this canon is complete and it's perfect and there's no new added revelation needed. Everything we need pertaining to life and godliness is found in this one book. And if we can become a student of your one book, you will use us like a sharp blade in your hand and you will do amazing things. Lord, I pray if there's anyone on any of our venues on our campuses today, maybe someone watching this at home, have never had a personal relationship with you that they would submit to you today. God, I'm tired of trying to be my own self-righteousness. It's, it's, it's exhausting. Lord, there's things that I know that I've done in my past that I can't fix, but I lay all that at your feet because you're perfect and I'm not. And I want what's true of you to be true of me. And I place my faith and trust in you today, Lord. Would you save my heart? Would you change my life? Would you enter in spirit of truth? And it doesn't mean tomorrow is going to be perfect. What it means is I will be with you perfectly tomorrow. Would you do that today, God, in someone's heart? And I'm so grateful that one day you did that in my heart. And I didn't choose you because I'm a little smarter than someone else. I chose you because I was broken. And that was a gift from you. We pray all these things and lift all these things up in the holy, precious, perfect name of Christ. Amen.